food funded in the end is really all about community and connections. Entrepreneurs and investors coming together. We'll be joined by Dr. Diane Johnson, whose work is focused on aligning mission, vision, values for purpose-driven businesses and their leaders. Diane is joined by Morgan Simon, a founding partner at the Candide Group, where she actively leads impact investing by supporting equity and inclusion. Also an author of the book, Real Impact, The New Economics of Social Change. Morgan has been featured by Harvard Business School and United Nations. And also joining them is the wonderful Funlayo Alabi, CEO of Shia Radiance, an inclusive and social impact focused global beauty brand that invites women to partake in the beauty rituals that have been used for centuries by African women. A warm welcome to you all ladies. And I would like to kick this panel off by asking Diane to share your thoughts on this critical topic of how do you navigate power, privilege, and justice while being socially, while, do, while doing your due diligence on the investment terms. Diane? Great, thank you so much, um, Priyanka. Um, nothing like starting with a simple question, right? <laughs> and I think the, um, this navigation of the imbalance around power and, and privilege within um, the, the structures um, that are at the foundation have gender bias and, and, and structural racism, that it, I think it takes a, a, prof, a prof, I wanna say, and I say profound for a reason, level of discernment and a level of, of um, inter, in, interrogation about where, how we are situated in the ecosystem on both sides. As, as entrepreneurs and as investors, and a, and a level of rigor around how our lived experiences shape how we engage with one another and how we collaborate and what, get, and what facilitates that collaboration and what serves as barriers. So I think it is the, the, this, we have to, um, uh, the invitation is to go out of are, are, are only our intellects and our heads and to recognize that we have to connect our what we know intellectually what we what we know from our lived experiences what we know somatically you know the our, the body um, knowledge to a in a sense a holistic orientation to see where we where and how we are situated and what assets and resources we bring to any conversation and any partnership and any and any collaboration, right? So that that's how it, that's how I would um, start it off. And Morgan, it's so good to see you. It has been it has been a while. And um, Pulayo, it's it's delightful to meet you. And so the question that I have is, given that we that we we come into our um, our relationships or development of relationships with an imbalance in power in the room, just by the fact of that we have one person on there or a number of people on one side of the table, at, uh, entrepreneurs who are, who are seeking resources, but they also bring so much. And then we have investors who have, you know, access, resources, et cetera. So I think one of the most um, powerful questions is given um, the dimensions of that power imbalance, how do we confront um, creating, you know, constructive money arrangements? How do, we, how do we shift and alter how we think about due diligence, how we think about valuation? How do we negotiate, um, you know, term sheets? So I'm curious for both of you, you know, what have you observed, witnessed, actually executed in, in, in the work that, you, that you're that you doing. Bulayo, do you wanna start? Yes, uh, thanks Diane. And that is that is a profound question, but as an entrepreneur who has been out there in the marketplace for over a decade, I have lived uh, the experience of that power imbalance. And one of the things at the end of the day 
beyond a lot of the technical talk is that I found out that we really need investors especially to be more self-aware. I know people don't want to be called racist, but let's face it, we live in a society where racism is in the water, it's in the air. You can't, you can't escape it. And I find that as an investor, if you're not self-aware, if you're not tuned into the fact that you've been socialized like everyone else to be biased, especially towards people of color and people who are black in particular, you can actually do more harm. Mm. And so what have I found in my experience as a, a, a businesswoman who is black, who is an immigrant, going to stores, wanting to see if we can get into more stores and getting responses that, oh, you know what, we already have one of you on the shelves. And, and th this is from progressive chains. I'm not talking about, I, I don't even want to say, I don't want to say Walmart because Walmart is progressive in many ways. I'm talking about very progressive chains where people are really woke and they still feel that they can only allow one person of color on the shelf at a time. So I always tell people, let's all just embrace our inner racist. Let's just start with the ground that we're all probably racist. And then the way to kind of check and see you know, how our biases are working is do the Polaroid test. I tell investors uh, or people who, who are you know, uh, I mean, I'm investing capital, take a look at your portfolio and just put a Polaroid picture of everyone you've invested in. I even encourage banks to do this yeah. and look and see how many people of color are there. I mean, you can think you're doing a really great job, but I, don't, I think pictures don't lie. So I'll just leave it there and say the Polaroid test is one of the ways that investors can see if they're really uh, diversifying their portfolio. And um, I wanna say something really quick about the power imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, that is there between investors and entrepreneurs. I think we also need to check our natural tendency to want to be extractive. Mm -hmm. And that's also where that self-awareness comes from, that we are so used when you are in uh, a situation of having more power, that there's a natural tendency to want to extract at the expense of the other person. And so that all goes back to this whole issue of self-awareness. Great. Thank you for that. We could have a whole conversation about the acculturation of the, the pathology of an ex extractive culture. But that's another, that's another session. Yes. <laughs> right? But I think that that is so true. And, 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 and Morgan, I'm thinking about so much of the work that you've been doing about um, uh, creating the opportunity for people to shift that mindset right, about extractive and the assumptions that investors are making about what, what they expect from their investment. So if, you, if, if that has the opportunity to, to come up in the conversation, I think people would really be um, uh, inspired to hear um, the work that you're doing. But um, I, I'm curious about your, your thoughts about how, how do we um, shift this power dynamic and what have you been doing um, in your, uh, either recently and also what you've, found to be better practices in the um, amazing array of, of the work that you've been doing for decades. Right. Um, thank you both. Um, and, and maybe just to give um, some context for folks on the phone who don't know me. So I happen to be white. I hold racist attitudes and I manage a lot of money. Um, and that means that people certainly see and experience me a certain way. And I see and experience people a certain way as well. Um, so with Candide Group, we um, support companies and funds, uh, both, uh, so both direct investments and funds. Um, over 50% of those investments are in women and people of color. And it's funny, normally if I was in my office, we have a map with Polaroids. <laughs> with pictures of all the investees. So, so I would say from that perspective, you would have seen a very vibrant wall. And actually last year it was over 75% of our investments. Uh, we did 20 million in investments to black and native and Latinx entrepreneurs in particular. Um, and I think within that, it means being very aware when we're entering those conversations. Um, uh, one is the, as investors being really clear on what our 
needs are and sometimes even the perception of need of are you are you prepared to be in a supportive relationship with entrepreneurs of color? Are, are you aware of what that is going to require of you? And if you're not prepared to bring it, maybe you're in the wrong conversation, right? Like, I think that's also part of um, the piece that we have to be ready to start with. Um, second is also, you know, when we talk about like what I, I was thinking about before this, what makes the power dynamic icky? Or like, what what are some of the moments of that? And I'm going to turn off the water before it starts boiling in all of your ears here. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, once you get to the table and say, okay, we're going to try to make a deal happen, we're aligned in our objectives. And I think that that's really point number one of saying we are both trying to create similar social change in the world, whatever that mission is, we're aligned on what type of financial value we think that can create. So ideally it's kind of, you know, they say the problem is on the wall, you're both on the same side of the table at that point. Except you really have to acknowledge, and I, I do think it's important in the American context, um, when we are talking about relationships between white folks and black folks, um, the idea that there was uh, hundreds of years of history of people being told what they were worth in a very explicit way. Mm -hmm. um, and that that is essentially, it's a conversation that we, we keep having that I think we need to be really aware of when we're putting money on the table. Um, and when we're trying to structure a deal, right? Um, that, that that's some of, um, some of the history that we really have to contend with. And at the same time, the idea that money can be a tool for justice, the idea that you can build wealth in communities, that you can divest yourself from resources if you determine that they weren't uh, well gotten in the first place, um, or that you can be building more power together for future generations. That's when I think you have this really exciting moment in terms of what can we build together? How are we gonna do it? And then Diane, to what you were saying, how do we structure it um, in, in a way that is going to really uh, create that non-extractive lens. And there's three things that I would note um, in terms of where we've kind of leaned in as Candide Group. One is this question of who is deciding, right? So right. We, we have a very diverse team um, in terms of our internal team, but we've also in the context of, um, for instance, the Olamina Fund, which is a debt fund that we that we founded and led and, and is about to finish deploying its first $40 million, um, where there's a community advisory board um, that is all women of color that have the opportunity to uh, to be influencing both pipeline and outcomes and how are we focusing and um, kind of being making sure that it's not just our team, but kind of a broader view in terms of what the needs are. Um, and we're seeing more and more investors saying, am I really the right person to be making this decision? Or is it just because I'm wealthy? And if so, that's a kind of dumb reason, right? <laughs> in terms of like, why yeah. am I going too well, long? Uh, Morgan, I, 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 want, I want you to hold on those two points, but I, I have to um, identify that that, that 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 inquiry about whether anyone should be the appropriate person making decisions and it is a is i think a a better practice around how we structure and address the power imbalance because all of a sudden we are taking privilege and privilege and power and the, and move and moving it and sharing it right as opposed to the 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 notion that because you have it, you have to you have to keep it, right? So, but but then the the, the other two things that you said, and then I have a, another another um, really important question that I want to ask both of you before we and before we have run out of time. But what are the other two things that you that you're um, the fun that I need to start? Right. So changing changing who invests. Mm -hmm. uh, prioritizing ownership. I think that's the other that a lot of impact investing I see is let's make it a little bit less crappy to be poor, or maybe it'll take 40 years instead of 30 that we all die of climate change, right? But that if we don't fundamentally shift ownership in society and asset disparity, we're not going to get there. And that means that we have really prioritized. So for instance, investments like uh, Chai Fresh, um, which is a co-op of uh, majority formerly incarcerated Black women and one man um, who uh, provide healthy meals, both as COVID relief and then for after-school programs and other venues. Um, but the idea that they were getting to be owners of the business and then our debt was helping them purchase their kitchen, not just lease a space, right, but have the opportunity to be ownership of real estate in that transaction. Um, and then the, the so, so at any rate, we've done a lot of worker ownership. We've been looking at ESOP conversions, like lots of different ways to really expand ownership. So it's also not just one entrepreneur, but much more broadly dispersed. And then the final um, point I was going to mention is um, 
how, you know, going back to what really puts you problem on the wall, you're both on the same side of the table. There's often, I, I think another, um, challenging moment um, in the context of trying to strike an investment deal that the investor fulfills their obligation on day one, right? Like I write the check and then like, maybe you want other support and, you know, try to like be uh, helpful in the business or whatnot, but the primary commitment, we do it on day one, whereas the entrepreneur, they might take five or 10 years to fulfill their role, which means that yes, the investor does want stuff on paper, right? Because they do want to see how is the entrepreneur going to fulfill their obligations over a period of time um, and that that can create some moments of tension in negotiating deals. What we learned, though, is that if we were truly aligned, so people often when they're um, doing deal terms, you have your lawyer, they have their lawyer, mm -hmm. and they call it opposing counsel. And you went from this idea of, oh, we're working together on one deal to wait. No, now I'm like opposing you. And there are these lawyers intermediating everything. Um, so what we did with Navajo Power, which is a um, majority Navajo, Navajo owned company um, that's building utility scale solar for the Navajo nation. And I'm gonna drop a link uh, to a, a blog post that we did on this. Um, we we uh, had a collaborative council um, mm -hmm. and we basically just let there be one lawyer and we were able to get it done at half the cost. And we're like, wait, we're aligned that the purpose of this deal is to maximize value for the Navajo nation. So let's just go do that <laughs> together, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it really shifted the relationship. That's beautiful. Thank you for those concrete examples. And I, I, have, to, I have to ask this question because I think one of the, the skills and capacities that we also need to address is when we are um, in partnership, building partnership, um, developing um, investment relationships, this question around the, the conversations that we are having, that, that the conversations about addressing our, you know, inner racist, our inner patriarch, our inner, you know, both exterior and interior. And, and I think this also relates to, again, the, the capacity that one has to be profoundly honest in, <clears throat> in their, their orientation is about how do we, how do we build skills around um, having those courageous conversations. I, I you know, I don't want to say uncomfortable conversations because I think comfort is a is a reflection of privilege, that that, that people conflate comfort and safety, and that there is this um, the, the the dynamic that happens about oh I, I feel uncomfortable. It's like well, welcome to the well, welcome to the world, right? <laughs> that, that it is not assumed that we always get to be comfortable. But what is it? That in in for both of you, and I'll start with you, um, um, Fulaya. <clears throat> what is it that what concrete capacities um, or core skills assist in that ability to sit in in the courage that's that's needed to have those conversations that are going to build relationships and build collaboration that allow us to um, confront the, 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 what I say, dysfunctional um, assumptions, like we have two lawyers, we are like we, there's an antagonistic orientation or the assumption of extractive, um, you know, the extractiveness of the relationships. What, like, what are the, what are the, what do people need to consider doing that is going to build, specifically build their capacity, strengthen their, their competency in the one-on-one -on -one conversations that we need to have? <laughs> I know, little you question. Know, um, <laughs> first of all, uh, let me bring my whole self into the conversation mm -hmm. as a Nigerian who has lived in this country for decades. And my, you know, that it's really a great question because at the end of it, what we need everyone to realize, especially those who are sitting in comfort and privilege, is that if you make the shift, it is going to be a win-win. Mm. You're we are all going to win. If you don't make the shift, it's going to be an ugly mess, and you're going to lose because the world is changing, and there also needs to be that paradigm shift, which is kind of built into Western civilization that for me to win, you have to lose. 
you know, and if you have something that I want, instead of us bartering, exchanging, I'm taking what you have, I'm shutting you down and I'm gonna own you. So those things are kind of built into the culture and civilization. We don't, people don't articulate it, but that's what leads people to sit in this fear that, wow, if we let other people in, that means there's less for us. But it's not a zero sum game. We can grow the pie. Everyone can prosper. And guess what? If we have more people at the table and everyone is prospering, this country is going to be better. I know everyone thinks America is the greatest nation in the world. I don't disagree, but I honestly do believe that America could be a hundred times more prosperous and a better nation than it is today if we had started having these conversations hundreds of years ago, if there hadn't been so many missed opportunities to do the right things and we failed to do it because we were afraid. And, and I think actually, it's, I think what's interesting is that there, in some instances, and it's, we were having these conversations and they're, and they're, yeah, so that's like, you know, and I think, but I think it has to do with, again, the, the pathological construct of scarcity of someone has to be at the bottom. We can't all win. So it is that, that you know, another sub question is how do we shift that mindset? But, but very, very specifically, Morgan. Yeah, I, I agree with the overall notion of like, the world will be better for everyone in that version of it, that, it, the, that um, privilege, that a commitment to white supremacy that's tightly held, like those are sicknesses, right? And the mm -hmm. extent to which people say, thank God I can find a path to heal that sickness. What an amazing opportunity, right? And like what that can do for everyone across the society, wherever you sit with it. And some of, um, this is gonna be a funny bridge into what does that look like when you convert that into investor speak? So for instance, mm -hmm. and, and like, yes. what are the ways that the systems that kind of perpetuate the sickness? So one simple one is this idea of market rate returns, right? Yep. That the market says, this is how much money you're supposed to make off an entrepreneur. And when we've kind of internally, we tend to talk about realistic returns of like, what's realistic for this project? And what does that mean in terms of from a non-extractive perspective? We're always trying to look numerically, how much is the community making? And that that needs to be more than what I'm going to make as an investor, or I'm not going to sleep well at night. Like I'm going to feel crappy about that. Right. And what's interesting, you know, we had, um, Candy Group, we mostly work with high net worth individuals and foundations. We've also some done some organizing of cultural influencers because there's this broader piece of how do you change the culture of money that I think that that's part of this overall conversation and like what mm -hmm. is supposed to be the objective of money and our collective sickness around money. Um, and we'd worked with um, like 30 plus influencers about um, committing publicly to keep their money out of private prisons. And uh, there was a, a $10 million commitment connected to that to move money into impact investing. And this was mostly NFL players and cast members of Orange is the New Black. And I recall when we were talking to some of those cast members around, oh, well, if I do social investing, like, am I gonna make less money? Like, what's gonna happen? And what was interesting, I, I, it was like, I, I mean, it's not surprising, but in terms of how quickly they got it, where I basically said, okay, well, maybe right now you're making 10% and um, you're destroying the environment and you're putting people in jail and you know, you're know you profiting off of family separation. And maybe like you'd make more money because a lot of the Harvard studies and whatnot show that like, if you follow social and environmental factors, like you will have better performance. Let's say that's true and you get 13%. Let's say that you invest in some stuff where it's an experiment and you make 8%, but you're no longer supporting that crap would you still see that collective return of sleep better at night, know that you're supporting things that are positive, still make your 8%? They're like, oh yeah, that's not a trade-off. That's not a trade-off at all, right? So right. I think right. the more that we see, like we all win when we're all happier, um, mm -hmm. but that that opportunity is available for everyone. Like to, to know that you are um, destroying others through your investments, like that, that causes real harm. Right. Um, and I think that that's where I want to help people like avoid doing that harm to themselves mm -hmm. and others in the process. Yeah. There are a couple of questions in the chat. I'm just going to, I'm kind of 
um, gather them together. And um, so, because what we are really talking about is the cultural transformation of money, right? And, and I'm thinking about, you know, Joel Solomon, it's like, how much is enough, right? Like, just, can we just ask that question? Like, do you really, like, how many millions or billions do, do we need? So there's like, the, like that fundamental question of, uh, like at at what scale <clears throat> does it does it make sense or not make sense to have to accumulate such a profound level of resources, right? And so if and if we're if we're asking that question, then how is it that folks who most often have privilege, you know, and have power and have access, you know, in the chat, it's like um, cisgendered white men in tech, right, who are um, emanations of this idea of hierarchy, extractive capitalism, urgency, like all those vestiges of white supremacy that is another, again, another session, um, you know, the organ, the cultural ramifications of white supremacy and that notion that everything is urgent, everything has to be done yesterday, you know, more, 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 more. So if we are asking people to transform their idea about what money is for, right, then it is a question, then it, again, it is a question about what, um, how do we do, how do we, and this I think was also important, how do we do things in, because I think it's so critical, because um, uh, that we look at, at air levels of the individual level, that the, the level about what's happening um, in our in our families, what's happening in our businesses, what's happening in our communi communities. It's like I often use this metaphor about the Petrushka, the Russian nesting dolls, where you have the smallest doll that's enclosed in another doll, it's a little bit larger and a little bit level, another, another. And that, that that's a representation of the um, interdependency that we are all talking about and the and the the level of, of intersectionality. And so it is a question about how do we um, facilitate people understanding how do we do change at the individual level, at the family level, at the company level, at the industry level. So it's a it's a, a question about how like what have we seen that actually assists in that um, a fundamental um, mind shift. That's my, that's, that's, that's another big question. You're good, Diane. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to, uh, maybe just some, uh, some, um, brief thoughts. What I think is interesting is that there's space for people who really want to go deep to get that sort of education and process. And like John is saying, the, the 12 step process. <laughs> and I think sometimes we also need to, as, or I feel as an activist, um, being okay with the fact that there's a lot of people who are really only going to do small things and, and therefore we have to make it easy for them that expecting people to like people live in cultures, right? So the idea of like, you have to change the frame and the institutions under which they operate, uh, even sometimes before changing the people. So yeah. it's as small as sometimes the things like, could we make it easier to just change where you bank? Could we make it so that these big corporations have the check the social choice box? It would be great if everyone was gonna do that on their own, but they're not, they're not. Like we just can't, like it's not reasonable uh, to, or rather in my opinion, uh, it, to think that we're gonna get everyone to make the change. So I, I think for those of us who are kind of willing to dive in deeper and dedicate our lives to this in this crazy sort of way, um, how do we make it easier for others to step in with their money, their time, their vote um, to at least shift things an inch further? Um, and then make sure that there are opportunities for more radical transformation for folks who are really ready for it. And I could name a million resources that I know I and others have used over time, um, but but I think that's that's definitely out there for the taking. Um, but I do think we have to change the culture and the frame more broadly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great, that's great. Wanna, I wanna invite to see if there's any um, any questions or comments since we have a, a, another, I think 10, another 10 minutes. I'm in our in our conversation and our dialogue, and I, I want to, um, you know, put this question out as as well related to Morgan to your point about <clears throat> the 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 instances um, that people can do small, you know, can do small but also you know um, powerful tools for change, 
as, you know, so again, it's like, what are we doing at the individual level and what are we doing at the systemic level, right? And, and, this is, and the question is, what do we say to the individuals who have this kind of either or? It's like, oh, we either have to do change on an individual um, orientation, and, uh, you know, or we can only look at things structurally, right? So I'm, I'm very curious as to what, what assists us in um, balancing, but, you know, um, that, that model of either or. Can I have it? You have thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak in, in detail to the either or model. We know it has to be both um, working on a parallel. But I think that at the end of the day, I think we need to keep trying to do a better job of helping people imagine mm. what the world, what this society can look like when we make the shift. You know, everyone is basically selfish. And the reason people are clutching to their privilege and they'll go drowning <laughs> down to the, you know, even if it's killing them and bringing so much dysfunction into their life because they are living these, these lives at the expense of others is because they fail to see um, the possibilities of what the world could look like, how meaningful and how rich their lives could be if they were willing to take the lens of white supremacy off and see the world as it really ought to be. So I'm always thinking of how do you paint the picture of the benefits that you're not really going to lose? Mm -hmm. um, this is, uh, you know, they talk of, about the arc of the moral universe, you know, bending yeah. towards justice. Oh, yes, yes. It is, you know, it's like if you're going the other way, you're actually fighting against the universe and, you know, you're going to lose. And so just getting picture better about painting the picture that, you know, even in, in the, in, for the, for the sake of self-interest, this is going to be good for you and good for everyone else. I think that is so key. Right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Maureen for you, Morgan, about the, the, the philanthropic side of your program, um, because I have a question about the, the distinction between phil the, your philanthropic program and equity investments. Sure. So as Candide Group, we do very, very limited philanthropy. It's not, it's not really yeah. a core piece of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and we do a, a pretty strong mix of um, equity investments, revenue shares, uh, debt. There's some that, that probably feel a little more like what people call recoverable grants, um, but it really mm -hmm. is always uh, part of the calculation of what instrument we're going to use is about what creates that non-extraction. Like what is what is essentially the economic benefit that's being created for right. the beneficiary community, the entrepreneur, if those are not the same thing, um, and then for the investors. Um, and to give an example, and, and, and then also another thing that's important about the debt conversation, debt versus equity, is mm -hmm. also about what is the ownership balance that that uh, entrepreneur entrepreneur community wants. So in the case of Navajo Power, we did that as debt uh, precisely uh, so that it would remain native owned. Um, and it's actually a covenant in the debt is that they have to maintain majority native ownership. Um, and then the other piece that we did was that uh, this goes back to if, if we had looked at the market, right, for that sort of capital, it probably would have been about 12%. We did it at two and we called the 10% difference a mission delta, which was essentially how much mission were we buying and made sure that that chunk of money is going directly to home solar systems on the Navajo Nation. Um, because utility scale solar tends to pass over people's heads and never actually get to folks on the ground, even if they get the economic benefit of it. Um, I think there is a really important deeper question. You could say, well, you could also just have that be a grant, like period, right? Like when do you ever, if, if the whole point is that you wanna like divest yourself from privilege and power, like should you just give your money away? There's mm -hmm. also mandates like that. So for instance, one of the families we work with that started the Katali Foundation where they formed it entirely as a spend down. Mm -hmm. um, there's other cases yeah. where I would say most of the vehicles that I'm investing when I get an investment return, and it's great to be able to have this conversation with the investees, the money that's coming back is not just making a wealthy person wealthier. It is either structurally going to ensure that that next entrepreneur gets a chance, right? So when we even just talk about why do investing at all versus philanthropy, 
Part of it is the idea of having a renewable resource for social movements and that entrepreneurs often want to be part of that kind of virtuous cycle of an economy where what they produce helps the next folks, right? Or there's times where um, if we're investing on behalf of a foundation, that money is being used to make sure to fund grants to the type of advocacy and organizing that is not going to have an earned revenue model attached that probably shouldn't have an earned revenue model attached, right? So I think we, we have to be really thoughtful about yes. when we're getting proceeds, what are they being used for? Yes, yes. And I think there's also a, a, a huge argument about um, how philanthropy has, like I, I think about uh, Anand Gerasidat's um, Winners Take All, which mm -hmm. is such an indictment about, again, the pathology within the, the philanthropic community. And so let's be clear and talk about, you know, power imbalance um, within, a, within a particular structure. You know, that, that's why we, I think, you know, my understanding of some of the motivation and inspiration for impact investing came out of the frustration about how philanthropy was, was not funding social movements and not forwarding um, justice, equity, and diversity, and inclusion. And it was basically funding those institutions that per perpetuated the status quo. Right, so the, it, it is again this question about what are the innovative structures, what are the innovative processes that we can co-create that actually impact individual a, as well as as well as um, the structures, right? So in the couple of minutes that, that we have left, what is um, one? a piece of advice or one invitation that you have to this audience in general or specifically to folks who are investors and folks who are entrepreneurs? Lai, I'll, I'll let you start. Well, I have to say that I was in uh, for most of the presentations this afternoon and I'm telling you, I know that the solutions in food, tech, art that are gonna have major impacts on our communities and society are coming from the black indigenous people of color group. Um, you all are the future. I'm from the beauty space and I'm listening into what is happening in the food space. And I am so excited that we have entrepreneurs who are thinking outside the box. They are not giving us the same old, same old stuff that we're finding at Costco. Um, I enjoyed hearing from, from Coin. I tried um, Kanda chocolates. I can't wait to try some of the other amazing brands and everything that is out there. Um, I, I feel like I, you know, we're, we're looking at the future. It's diverse, it's beautiful, it's rich, it's delicious. Um, it's really exciting, so. Great, thanks Morgan. Um, I think, Two things. One, from from my time and having been on the fundraising side at points, I think always trying to walk into those conversations with, I am doing this amazing, hard to do thing. And this other person, all they have to do is write a check and they get to say that they were part of it. Right. And that that's like really the easy part of that transaction. And like, they should be so lucky that I'm like willing to take their money. Um, and I think kind of having some of that attitude, cause it's really like, it's not just an attitude, like it's actually true, right. In terms of the day-to-day -day work, um, I think can, can really help. Um, and then the second piece that I would say for everyone around the table is just to be clear with yourself. Um, when is something personal and deeply personal? And when is it deeply not personal? <laughs> um, and that if there's moments where we're finding what's our, like whether it's our positionality within a uh, particular situation or um, what it means to be negotiating terms or what does it mean to achieve alignment um, of just being really clear. Some, sometimes we have to be clear in like, who is it that we are actually talking to? Um, and who is it that we are showing up as? And the more that we're able to kind of separate that sometimes, I think that that can help to get into what are the really necessary conversations as opposed to, to kind of skirting around it in a, in a um, I, I, was, I was about to say in a much more comfortable way, but I appreciated Diane, your point of like, that's not the point, right? But let's just be in a more uh, really aware way. Um, and, and in a way that ultimately does create space for everyone to, to learn and grow. Mm -hmm. Great. 
So I want, for many of you who um, know me and have worked with me in my work as um, CEO of Mapu Consulting. So I, I love poetry and I love um, an inspirational quote. So I'm going to, to leave you um, with a, a quote from a, a colleague and dear friend of mine, Starhawk, where she talks about that um, magic is about power and how do we call forth power and to utilize it for positive change. You know, if we are going to raise power and channel it as an energy for achieving our goals of creating, you know, a collective and more just world, we need to understand what power is and what it is not. Right? And I and I think um, this is so true because one of the things that I want to invite each and every one of us um, on who've been here today and to thank all the sponsors and, and all the, the, the amazing entrepreneurs and, and, and speakers and, and the level of collaboration that's happened here today. But I, that I want us to fully embrace the power that we have, right? And the, but the privilege that we have, because the fact that we are here at this gathering means that we have privilege, right? We, um, and and that, but that we take that power, we take the the privilege that we have, that we have vision, and that we believe in ourselves, and we believe in a, in a world where we want to create justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the food and in the ag space and in the social entrepreneur space, and that we hold on to that magic, we hold on to that power, and that we use it responsibly, and that we build well true authentic relationships. With, with that with that magic and with that power. So thank you all. Thank you, Diane, Fun Layo, and Morgan. This has been such a real, truthful conversation. I'm I'm sure everyone in the audience has been, you know, feeling so inspired, so hopeful listening to you all. It's it's thank you so much. And now on the virtual stage, we will see our longtime friend Carlota Mast. <coughs> Carlota Mast a friend and longtime food funded supporter, is a senior vice president of content and insights at New Hope Network that some of you know through Natural Food, Natural food Products Expo East or Expo West. Along with that, she's also the co-founder of Jedi Collaborative. I welcome Carlota. Thank you so much, Priyanka. And Basically, on behalf of, of New Hope and the Jedi Collaborative, especially, I just I want to say thank you. What a special day we've had, and you know, thank you to the food funded team, which is is primarily made up of volunteers who who are really dedicated to to this work. Thank you for creating this platform, and thank you to the presenting companies for inspiring us with the innovation and real solutions and passion you are bringing into the world. I agree um, that that what we saw today can represents the real solutions that are needed. And, and thank you to all of the speakers and participants for co-creating a space for direct conversation related to power, privilege, and justice in the funding ecosystem. And I'm really eager to continue this dialogue and work toward real and meaningful change as, as Diane noted, you know, at the individual and systemic levels. And so we are looking forward to continuing to support this work and just thank you all for, for being part of it. Thank you, Carlotta. And with that being said, that's a wrap. Thank you everyone to making this event Food Funded Jedi Edition such a huge success. I'm sure you all have enjoyed this program tremendously. A big thank you and a round of applause to our wonderful speakers, presenters, partners, entrepreneurs, and our supportive audience members for being so um, encouraging and inspiring and for having this wonderful conversation with us. A big shout out to our program sponsors, Whole Foods and BPM for their continued support. We hope to stay connected with all of you through our further newsletters and would like to hear from you on how we did and how we can do better. Do share your thoughts. We're also quite excited to announce our next event coming up, Food Funded Climate Edition on July 21st. And we look, to, look forward to seeing such familiar and friendly faces again. Until then, let's all stay safe, keep supporting our local food businesses, 
and let's keep striving towards getting food funded. Thank you all.